Let's look at verse number one together, Acts chapter number one. Uh, the, uh, the writer here, of course, is none other than Luke, and uh, we know that uh, through uh, common authorship, verse number one and two, I believe it's very, uh, it's very apparent who wrote this book because it begins the same way that Luke chapter number one, verse one and two began, and it, this passage says that it is a continuation of that book. Look at verse one. The Bible says the former treatise, that would be the gospel of Luke, the former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he <clears throat> showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them <clears throat> forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, <clears throat> ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. <clears throat> When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <clears throat> and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. <clears throat> And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Notice these words that are in these next few verses. The Bible says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, as Christ was ascending, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Why stand, why, excuse me, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so sh uh, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Uh, then verse 12 says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, uh, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zalotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus uh, uh, and with his brethren. I'm going to conclude our reading there uh, for this morning. I just want, thank you brother, I just wanted to uh, give us a, kind of an, um, a synopsis of where we are. Uh, in verse number one we see that uh, the Bible is talking about Luke giving us an account of uh, G that how in Luke's gospel he gave us an account of the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. The Bible said that it was all, verse number one of our text said that Luke wrote of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. That is speaking of his life and the actions of his life. That is speaking about his teaching and his actions uh, throughout not just his life, but also the three and a half years of his earthly ministry as he taught. And then verse number two tells us when uh, th this epistle, or excuse me, this letter or this uh, book of the Bible rather will pick up. The Bible says in verse two, and until the day in which he was taken up. So his ascension, when he went back to heaven. And the Bible says, after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And so I think everyone in here uh, has been a part of one of our uh, most recent sermon series here at the church about the Great Commission. And so I'm not going to take the time to get into the Great Commission, uh, but that is part of the commandments that Jesus gave uh, to his 
His disciples. And so what we want to look at this morning, uh, as you can tell by the uh, handouts that we have given, uh, we're teaching this morning on the founding of the New Testament church in Jerusalem. And so throughout this month, what we're going to be doing is we're going to compare two biblical churches in the book of Acts and compare their effectiveness uh, for the kingdom of God's sake. This morning will be a little bit uh, of intro, uh, a little bit of introductory thoughts as we will build on those in the weeks to come. And Lord willing, Brother Tommy will be able to be back uh, ne- this coming Sunday, one week from today, and teach you this second lesson. And so we're talking about the founding of this New Testament church in Jerusalem. And I'll say this: I believe it is important for us to understand that uh, this uh, these commandments that were given that uh, we call the Great Commission uh, were things that uh, began in the heart of Jesus uh, much before uh, these words were spoken in Acts chapter number 1. Uh, I, I would say something about uh, this, this morning about uh, how there is a cause and effect that is pretty important in the secular world. Uh, the concept of cause and effect is vital to productivity. A person will analyze a result. He will then break that result down to the individual ingredients or factors that produce the result. Then the process, uh, that process is how he, mis- how uh, mistakes are corrected that produced an undesirable result and how a result can be duplicated to continue to produce the desired product. And you say, preacher, what are you talking about? I believe that there is an effect in the Great Commission that was started by a cause in the heart of Jesus, even as we will see uh, during the days of his earthly ministry that caused him as he was uh, p- preparing to ascend and to leave the ministry to them, if I can put it that way, commanded them what he commanded them and gave them the words of the Great Commission. And so we see here uh, in this passage, the Great Commission is stated that commandment that uh, verse 2 uh, talked about is uh, expressly laid out in verse number 8 where the Bible says, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. That sounds like a commandment to me. Ye shall be witnesses. Not an option, not uh, something that uh, is to be questioned or uh, or uh, taken as something that uh, is a take it or leave it type scenario. Jesus said, ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and on the uttermost part of the earth. My question this morning is if we shall be witnesses, what kind of witnesses are we? You're going to be a witness, Jesus said. You can be a witness of, uh, you can be a witness of bad things and show off the worst of uh, Jesus' church and Jesus' children, or you can show off the best of uh, what God would have out of a Christian's life. Amen. And so I think we see that in this early church. Amen. And so there is no question that God gave very clear instructions to his church as to what he desired for his finished product as as the cause and effect was working out. Uh, He had a product that he wanted to have finished the right way and so there's no doubt as to what the Bible says he desired for his finished product to be as he desired to have as his finished product of his commands and his commission. He desired that there be a church that would be focused on introducing him to the entire world that he so loved and for which he died. Jesus in the Great Commission passages of the Bible stated uh, his intention uh, for what he desired out of the ministry of this church that is being founded and as Acts 1-8 says it begins in Jerusalem. We're talking about the founding of the church in Jerusalem. That was the starting place of God's work uh, in this world. It started in Jerusalem and the intention was for it to spread beyond there as Christians would introduce
introduce uh, the Lord to the nations of the world. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew uh, chapter number 28 that Jesus told them to teach all nations. They were told to reach beyond going to just the Jewish people and those residents there in Jerusalem and they were to go to everyone for whom Jesus had shed his blood to save. And the last time I checked we believed here at this church that Jesus shed his blood to atone and to pay for the sins of the entire world. Amen. Goes right there. Amen. So they were told to teach all nations. They were told to reach all nations. They were told to reach out to every creature and they were told for that not to stop there but that they were to teach, to baptize and to continue teaching these new converts all of the things that Jesus had taught. I think we understand that between this lesson and then our recent sermon series. So uh, the question is though, uh, is it okay for us to just send the messenger or is there something that has to be added to that? Is there something that is missing if we just send the messenger? By that I mean when the Bible says in verse number 8, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. In that verse the messenger is something that is very clear to see that God wants people to go to their Jerusalem to their Judea, to their Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and be a witness for him. But when he says, ye shall be witnesses unto me, you know, the reason why we have a National Bible Publishing Month is because sending messengers is not enough. We've got, and you say, preacher, oh, well, we give the missions. We want to send messengers, yes. But if we send messengers and fail to send them without the message, we have really messed things up. Here, the, they're told to be witnesses. What are they witnessing of? What the scriptures say about Jesus. They're witnessing of Jesus and his saving power. If we go to Jerusalem and we do not take the message of the Bible to our Jerusalem, then our ministry has lost its authority. If we go to the uttermost part of the earth and we go to places where we send, their myth, send them messengers and we tell them what the Bible says, but we still leave them without a copy of the Word of God, in their language, they are only on the precipice of what walking with God and being a Christian, uh, enters, they're on the precipice of enjoying uh, what it means to be a Christian. But if you translate, as we, as Baron Precious Seed has tried to do, and is trying to do with their translation school, and they're trying to get funds, over $200,000 of funds is their goal this year to print the Bible. Here's what they're saying. We don't want to just send a messenger to preach what the Bible says to them, but we want to put a Bible in their hand so that when the messenger moves to the next town and the, or the messenger goes to be with the Lord in heaven, they still have what the messenger declared. They have the message that will help them to continue to grow in, uh, in the things of God. And so we see uh, the importance of both message and messenger uh, this morning. Amen. Let let me ask you this question. Are we able to teach all things whatsoever the Lord has commanded for them without having the scriptures from which they are to teach them? If we don't have, and I understand in this early church the scriptures were still being written and the, the, they did not have, and that, by the way, that ought to make us be, we ought to be the most privileged people in the world because there has been, uh, there, it, there have been entire generations upon generations of people who the, where the Word of God existed but it never existed altogether in one volume like we have today. We ought to be very thankful that we have the Bible. There are, there are people even today that all they have is a piece of the Word of God. There are entire countries to where the only Bible that exists in their language is one book of the Bible or just the New Testament of the Bible. All they know about Genesis 1-1 is stories that they've heard their preachers talk about that God created the world. Could you imagine living in a country amen, where you go to church and a preacher will talk to you about things that's happened in the Old Testament and they have to, they have to give you the storyline, if you will, of the Old Testament because you have not had a copy of the Bible in your hand to read it in your own language. 
to where you have to rely on what the preacher says or what the Sunday school teacher says or the Bible teacher or whatever it may be in their, in their particular congregation. You have to rely on what they say because it does not exist in your language yet. That's why it was it's so important upon my heart that we join in this effort is because the Bible has much to say about sending messengers. And in August, we talked about sending messengers. We talked about sending missionaries and being a missionary to our Jerusalem. We talked about those things. But this month in October, we're going to talk about getting the message out. Providing for the message to where even when the messenger's gone, by the way, let me say this, the only messenger that's truly needed for someone to get saved and to grow in faith is if they have a copy of the Word of God. The only messenger they actually absolutely have to have is a messenger of the Holy Spirit of God. If, you're, if, you, if you get saved and you have a Bible and the, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you, you can grow in your faith just from reading it. But I'll say this, it is important that we send messengers. It is important that we send a messenger to the world to preach the gospel so folks can get saved. And then when they get saved, put a Bible in their hands so they can grow in faith on their own. So we see the importance of this, how we cannot uh, teach all things without the scriptures and how the nations of the world cannot be taught all things without having the scriptures in their hand to teach them. Mark says that we are to go, uh, we are to uh, give the word, we are to give all of the word of God and to preach the gospel gospel to every creature. Luke records in the last words of Christ before he ascended to the Father. Uh, amen. And here in our text that they shall be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. One of the ways that we can be effectual uh, in all of those spheres at the same time. The Bible says both. Meaning that one and the same time. You can do that by having a vibrant missions program to where you are sending missionaries and sending messages messengers to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. But another way we can go about fulfilling this great commission is not just sending the messenger to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth, but making sure we send the message as well. I wonder how many times we as churches, we give to missions, we take on missionaries, and we send the messengers, but how many churches of the Lord Jesus take time every year to make sure that they have a part of their missions program where they are giving out the message. I'm not just talking about sending a preacher with the message, but I'm talking about handing out the message, getting the Bibles into the hands of those that need it. And the Lord has put the, the, those things on my heart in these days preparing for this month. Let me, for those of you that are uh, taking notes uh, in your adult lessons, that uh, you young people, y'all get out. Y'all just have to follow along. Y'all don't have anything to fill in. Let's first of all talk this morning about God's desire for the message. God's desire for the message. God in us getting the message out, the reason why he wants the message to get out, he wants the Bible to be in the hands of those that are converted when God sends a messenger and he preaches the gospel to them and they give their heart to Jesus. The reason why we ought to be about not just sending missionaries but printing Bibles and raising money for Bibles and buying Bibles to put into the hands of folks even that come in this church, it's because God God has a desire for the message in those that get saved, and that desire is that they do not remain as babies in Christ. You know, there's a lot of people, and we could go to the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews talked about how he had to feed them with milk and not with meat because they were not able to handle it. He could not give them strong meat because they were not able to handle it. And I'll say this, that there are a lot of ch uh, Christians in our Baptist churches that all they can get is just milk because they have not learned and not grown to the place place where they can handle the meat of the Word of God. So your first fill in the blank there is God's desire for the message. Again, that would be on the adult pages, not uh, on the teen pages. Notice and we see God's desire for the message. Uh, the, the, he wants us to grow spiritually that we may effectively introduce him to others with whom he desires to have a relationship and this type of growth only happens through having the rest of 
the Bible to go along with the gospel. In Acts chapter 6 and verse number 7, the church in Jerusalem emphasized reaching the Jews, and the Bible says the word of God increased. Do you see that there in your Bibles in Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 7? The Bible said, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we find the word of God, um, the word of God increasing, and 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 going and and going in a going in places and reaching a greater group than was before. It increased when the early church extended its reach to the Gentiles in a couple of cities. Look at Acts chapter number twelve. Acts chapter number twelve and verse number twenty-four. Look there with me real quickly this morning. Acts chapter twelve, verse twenty-four. When the early church extended its reach to the Gentiles in a couple of cities, the Bible says that the word of God grew and multiplied. Look at verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Do you see the difference in Jerusalem, as long as they were ministering to Jerusalem in their particular area, without branching out and moving on, the Word of God increased. By the way, if you preach the truth and you get the Bible out, amen, you get what God said out, the Word of God will increase in those that hear it. But then here the Bible says, beyond the increase, the Word of God grew, and then the Word of God multiplied. It grew on top of growing. Amen. Amen. I think we all understand what multiplication is. Hey Amen. It's doubling and tripling and quadrupling in its effect. So we see that the Word of God uh, grew and multiplied. When the church at Antioch that we'll deal with more in subsequent weeks, when they practiced total obedience to Jesus' last command in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8, and went beyond their Jerusalem, and they began to go to the world, the Bible says in Acts chapter number 19, and in verse number 20, lay your eyes on that verse with me this morning. Acts 19 and verse 20. The Bible says, so mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Let me take just a pause right here and give you a little bit of background to the book of Acts. In those early days, with those early disciples, you know what the, those early apostles, you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to stay in Jerusalem. They wanted to minister to the Jews only. You want to talk about Peter branching out and realizing that there's a Gentile world out there that needs the gospel? They heard from the words of Jesus. They were to start in Jerusalem and branch out. But I believe if those of you Bible students in here will understand that it took Jesus twisting the arm of Peter before he realized that there was a Gentile world out there that he himself was supposed to reach. He didn't want to become unclean by reaching a Gentile world. But God twisted his arm and the gospel spread. If you study the book of Acts. Do you know when in Acts chapter, what is it, Acts chapter number 8, I believe it is, amen, where you find the uh, you find the ministry of Philip in Acts, I believe, what is that, Acts chapter number 8, I believe, amen, Acts chapter number 8, you find the, uh, yes, in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse number 4 and 5, amen, look at verse Acts chapter 8, verse 4. The Bible says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Let me say this, I would love for our church to get the, get the, have the Word of God multiply and increase and greatly grow because we took it upon ourselves to send the Word out. I hope it doesn't take persecution for the Word of God to get out. But can I say that's what it took in the early church. Do you know that the, the, main reason, uh, the, the, the main reason why God had to send persecution to that early church in Acts chapter number 8 that caused them to be fleeing from Jerusalem and running away from the hotbed of persecution is because God told them there was a world that needed to be reached. God told them that there, uh, was, a, there was a Judea and a Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth, not just a Jerusalem. And God said, if you won't do it willingly, I'll send persecution that will scatter you to where I want you to go and when you get there you'll spread the word of God there. You won't have a choice but to get to Samaria. You won't have a choice but to get to Judea or to the uttermost part of the earth. And so we see that here in the word of God. How the Bible uses Philip in Samaria because he sent persecution. Amen. And so we see this here in the text. So we realize that in God's desire for the message he desires that the message increase. He desires that the message multiply. He desires 
desires of the message will greatly grow and the Word of God will prevail, Acts chapter number 19 and verse number 20, in the lives of those that hear it. So we see God's desire for the message. Now let me pause right there, and for those of you adults, let me turn your attention to the outline on the next page. We, let me say something about, number one, the foundation of this New Testament church. I believe as we see the desire for the message, we realize that His desire, Christ's desire for the message, how He wants it to increase, He wants it to multiply, He wants it to grow mightily. I believe we saw allusions to His desire for the Word of God and for the advancement of the church even before the book of Acts. Notice with me, and you can, those of you Adults can write this down. Notice we see the focus of Christ's actions while on earth. The foundation of everything that is done in the New Testament church started, I believe, in the heart of the Lord Jesus during the days of His earthly ministry. I believe that Jesus had a focus even as a child, 12 years old in the temple. Amen. Amazing the doctors and scholars in the temple. I believe that Jesus had a focus at 29 years old, before he, the year before He began His earthly ministry, what He was going to do at 30, 31, 32, and 33. Three and 33 and a half. Amen. I don't know where the half comes from, but I've always heard 33 and a half. Amen. And so, but in all of those years of his ministry, I believe his life prior to his ministry, he had the focus on, I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to lay down my life because the church and the advancement of the local church's ministry and the advancement of the Great Commission and the propagating of not just the gospel, but the publishing of God's Word all around the world and getting the Word of God to the nations of the world for their spiritual growth, I believe it was always in the mind's eye of God. I believe it was always in Jesus' focus while He did everything that He did. We see the focus of Christ's actions while on the earth. Jesus said in Matthew, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I have got to hurry. Matthew chapter number 16. <clears throat> Matthew 16. Look at verse number 18, very famous passage. The Catholic Church likes to take this verse and use it for their purposes, but I don't see even a hint of Catholicism in this verse. Amen. Verse 18 says, and I say, this is Jesus speaking, and I say also unto thee, speaking to Peter here, he said, thou art Peter, Peter meaning rock. And he said, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I do not believe Jesus is saying that he will build a church upon Peter's apostleship. That's why the Catholic Church teaches this. I believe that he calls him Peter because there are, there, in Peter's ministry, there there is an element of being a rock. There is stabilizing in Peter's ministry. He used Peter as the foundation for the early part of the church's ministry with his message on Pentecost and him being used of God all the way until God calls the Apostle Paul and uses him to reach the Gentiles. I believe there's an element of that there, and I believe that Jesus here is using a play on words. He's calling Peter Peter, which means rock, because he's about to talk about uh, what he is going to do. Upon this rock I will build my church. I personally believe that Jesus when he says I will build my church upon this rock I don't believe we're talking about the rock of Peter. I believe we're talking about the rock of Christ himself. I believe he calls him that as a play on words to remind him while you may be called a rock while that may be the meaning of your name Petra, that may be the meaning of your name. There is a rock that I'm going to build my church on and it's not going to be on Peter but it's going to be on myself. By the way I wouldn't want to be a part of a church built on Peter. You study Peter's characteristics in the Bible. Amen. I don't want to go into a, amen, go into a church and be a part of a church built on Peter, built on a, on a mere uh, man. Amen. I want my church to be built on Christ, the solid rock. Amen. And so we see here what he says. Notice he says, upon this rock I will build my church. 
Now there is a prevailing teaching among independent Baptists as to when the church began. When the official birthday of the church was. And I'm not going to debate anybody as to what they believe. I know men greater than me have believed according to this verse that the church started during Jesus' earthly ministry. I have heard a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different opinions on that. But I will say that I disagree with that because Jesus here says, I will build my church. Not I am building my church. I believe, remember the word I said just a minute ago, the focus of Jesus' actions while on earth. I believe when he says I will build my church, that is a word of focus. And he is telling us what his focus is and his purpose and what he is doing is. But Jesus here uses a term that is a future tense word. I will build. As in, I'm not building it right now, but I'm going to build my church. So we see Christ said in Matthew 16 verse 18, I will build my church. Amen. Number two in uh, Ephesians 5, and I'm just, y'all just going to have to follow along with me and search the scriptures after the lesson if I'm going to get through this. But Ephesians 5 25, Jesus said, the Bible said that he loved the church and gave himself for it. In the fact that he gave himself for it, I believe we see the focus of Jesus' actions on this earth. I've added this to the lesson. I believe that I will build is a purposeful focus. He's telling you what his purpose is. I believe in the second passage in Ephesians 5, 25, we see a passionate focus because we see that Jesus' focus was on something that he loved and he loved the church so much that he gave us a, a purchasing focus. The, the, Acts 20 verse 28 says that he purchased the church with his own blood. So you say, what, what was Jesus' actions while on earth? Well, it is the fact that he wanted to build a church, the, the, church, the church of the living God. And then he did something about it. He gave himself so that he could purchase the church with his own blood. And then you and I could have what we have today. By the way, when he talks about purchasing a church and building a church, he's not talking about building a structure and purchasing a building. He's talking about purchasing the saints of God that make up the church of the living God. And the church is not this building. The church is you and I that meet in this building. So we see the foundation of the New Testament church was founded because of Christ, focus, the focus of Christ's actions while on earth. Ephesians 5, 25, talking about Christ loving the church and giving himself for it. The foundation of the New Testament church was because of the focus of Jesus' affection. He loved the church. You say, preacher, how could Jesus love a church if he had loved the church when he gave his life for the church? But the church hadn't been built yet? That's a good question. Again, I thank God I have a sovereign God. I thank God I have a God that's outside of time. I thank God I have a, a God that had enough focus, amen, that he had in his mind and he had in his plan before the foundation of the world a building of a church and a purchasing of the church and a saving of individuals that would become the church of the living God before he was ever born and before he ever lived in the days of his life perfectly and sinlessly, before before he ever laid his body down on an old rugged cross, before he was ever lifted up and suspended between heaven and earth to die for our sins, I believe Jesus had a focus because of his affection and his love for those that would come to be his children and a part of his church. Amen. So it's founded on the focus of Jesus' actions while on earth. It is founded on the focus of Jesus' affection. But then we see the focus of Jesus' attention now. Look at Matthew 16 verse 18 again. I know I'm, I'm going to have to have, I'm going to have to tell Tom he's got to finish this message and do next week. So amen. Look at verse 18 again of Matthew 16. The Bible says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. So I will build. That shows us Jesus' focus. But notice this. We see the next he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me ask you this question. Is there anybody in church this morning that is thankful that Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church? 
I, mean, it, I know we're living in a day where we have, it looks like the gates of hell are prevailing in this church. But I'll say this, Jesus said that it will not. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen. And so I say this morning, I think about what he says, the gates of hell. Do you know that the gate? and I don't have the time to go through all the verses, but you do a study of the word gates in the scriptures. The word gates in the Bible is often used in uh, the word of God to denote one's counsels or designs or his purpose. The gates in Old Testament cities were the places to where uh, their most important businesses, uh, uh, business was uh, conducted. That was where the leaders of the town would see it and they would conduct the business for the city. And so when it talks about the gates, it's talking about the place where business gets done. You're talking about the gates of hell. It's talking about the designs and the evil purposes uh, of, uh, of hell. Amen. And can I tell you, Jesus said that all of the evil purposes of hell hell shall not prevail against the church. Now we may let uh, some forces of hell prevail against us from time to time, but for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will never be a day where there will not be a church. There will never be a day where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is forever going to be defeated. Amen. Jesus said the gates of hell, the evil intentions of hell, the evil designs and concoctions of hell, the place where hell wants to do its business, no matter how much Amen. The devil or the demons of hell say we're going to do business against the church and we're going to prevail. Jesus said it is not going to happen. Amen. And if I can put it this way, Jesus said no way, Jose. It's not going to happen. You, I, you can mark it down. You can take it to the bank. You can guarantee the church will prevail. And I think we all would be more excited about that than we are. The foundation of the New Testament church, I don't have the time to, to teach this, but the functioning of the New Testament church. The New Testament, you, you'll have to go back and do some homework, amen. They were unified. They had a love for the brethren. They had obvious signs of God's activity working among the body. Their lives showed evidence of their relationship with Christ. Throughout all of the things that they were doing, they gave God all of the credit with all of the miracles and all of the things that you would look at on the outside and say, only God can do this. Those type of things that the Lord was doing in their midst, they didn't take any of the credit for it. They gave God all the credit for it. In Acts 5, verse 33 through 40, we find that the New Testament church functioned in such a way to where false teachers were disproved over time. In Acts 6, verse 5 and 6, we see that they established leaders, which in the text I believe talks about, amen, they already had the apostles in leadership. They added to them the office of a deacon to be leaders and servants in the church. They established leaders that would help the work move forward. That's the whole reason God created a deacon in the first place. It's not to be a ruler in the church. It's not to chart the direction of the church, but to help the church of God move forward. And that's what Stephen and those men were, were uh, doing. So we find the foundation of the New Testament church was rooted in Jesus. That was his desire. Amen. But then look on the, the, look on the previous page, not this outline, but where you looked at God's desire for the message on the previous page. The second thing we see is the results of the message. The results of the message are those things I stated for you underneath that heading on the outline, the functioning of the New Testament church, them being unified, them having love for the brethren, them having obvious signs of God's activity among the, church, among the body, them uh, having lives that showed evidence of their relationship with Christ, them giving God all the credit for the great things that he did, the false teachers being disproved over time, the establishing of leaders to help the church move forward. All of those things was the result of of the message getting out. The reason why the church was able to go forward is because as they sent messengers, messengers that God had spoken to and led, the Word of God was prevailing. The Word of God was growing. It was getting out. And so now, just as always happens when the Word of God gets into somebody's hands, there's results. You, if you have, if there's somebody you know that does not have a Bible, and they does not because, amen. If they don't have a Bible, they can't get a Bible. Whatever the case, amen. We've got plenty of them, and we run out. We'll give you more. Put it in somebody's hand. You say, preacher, why? Do, why do we do that? And we've already given out dozens of them in, in the time I've been here. Folks coming in needing the Bible. And I appreciate those who've gotten the Bibles, and I appreciate the church allowing me to get those those Rock of Ages Bibles and things of that nature. 
But I love being able to put the Word of God in somebody's hand. The reason is because I know there's going to be results that come from that. The Bible says over in the Bible says in the Old Testament that the Word of God in the book of Isaiah, that it will accomplish the thing it was sent forth to do. It will do it. In other words, if you put the seed of the Word of God in somebody's hand, the Holy Ghost of God will touch His Word, will honor His Word, and the seed of the Word of God will germinate in the heart of man, and there will be fruit that comes from it. There will be a result. Amen. So we see the results of the, this message being sent. The messenger taking the message clearly produced unification and direction and focus in the lives of those um, that uh, received the Word of God in that early church. They had a genuine concern for others in the church and the message caused them to meet those needs, to have uh, these functioning, uh, these results that um, per per participated in the early function of the New Testament church. Lastly, I'll give you this and we're done. We see the foundation of the New Testament church. We see the functioning of the New Testament church. Number three on the outline adults, we see the fruit of the New Testament church. The fruit of the New Testament church. Acts chapter 2 verse 41, the Bible talks about 3,000 souls being added after pre Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost. You want to talk about fruit? You want to talk about multiplication? Look at Acts chapter number 4. I'm trying to see through sweat and it's not working. Acts chapter number 4. Look at verse number 4. This is after the day of Pentecost. This is after the Lord added 3,000 souls to the church. Verse 4. The Bible says of Acts 4, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. You've taken 3,000, and now you've added to them Five, five, you've added, uh, you've increased them to 5,000, or you, you either have increased them to 5,000 or added 5,000, depending on how you read that verse, just a couple of pages away from the great day of Pentecost. I would say this church is growing. This church is expanding. And the reason why is because the Word of God is getting out into the hearts of those that have never heard. The best way, dear friend, to grow a church is not trying to steal members from other churches. The best way to grow a church is to put the message, put the Bible, put the Word into somebody's hands and into somebody's life and to see them saved and have fruit in their life of being born again. And that Word will cause them to grow. 3,000 Added to the ch church after Pentecost, 5,000 men believed uh, the following, following the preaching on another day in Acts 4. In Acts chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says multitudes of men and women were added to the church on another day. Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 7, from that point the Word of God is increasing. So let me ask you this this morning as we close. Here's the way I want you to apply the message to your heart. What can we do to cause... The Word of God. Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but just search your mind and your heart this morning. What can we do as individual Christians? What can we do as Christian servants? What can we do as a church body that would cause the Word of God to increase in our lives, in the lives of others, and in the lives of those all over the world? This month, I want us to take time to do a very small part. I told you I'm praying I, I'm praying God sends in $5,000 for us to hand to Bob Ford and the Barren Precious Seed Ministry. That's what I'm praying for. Their goal is 200000 now, that's all of the churches. Not, they, they haven't laid this year on us, but all the churches coming together, that's their goal. One, we can't, we, there's a lot of things we can do, but the one thing we can do, even it being a small amount to help the Word of God increase in the world that we're living in, is to make sure that Bible keeps getting printed in our language and in the languages of the world, and we can put it in the hands of somebody else so that they can receive the Word and it increase in their life. Amen. Let's pray.